plan on doing it. These first flights to Mars will be uncrewed and will test the reliability of landing intact. If those landings go well, the first crewed flights will follow soon after. So it's safe to say it's all happening, and flights like today's are what's going to get us there. Not only have we made several improvements to the Starship flying today based on what we've learned from our last flight, including extensive upgrades to Starship's hardware and software, we've also made improvements to the launch tower and catch mechanisms. And if you've noticed in some of the live views this morning, our teams have completed stacking the second launch tower, which will be coming online next year. Having two operational launch towers paired with ships and boosters rolling off the line in our new star factory will allow us to increase our flight cadence and test even more rapidly. And just a few miles away from the two towers, things are moving really fast at the heart of Starbase. Star Factory is rapidly coming online, with production teams already using the space for as construction continues. The one million square foot Star Factory brings many parts of the manufacturing process under one roof for the first time, enabling moving as much system integration work as possible earlier in the build process, with the goal of eventually producing hundreds of starships a year. That's crazy. It's such an <laughs> impressive building. So, for example, teams can assemble an entire nose cone structure of a ship into a single piece and work on its internal systems all in one place. So if you're working on Starship and you have a question about the steps that you're working that happened before or after yours, instead of having to leave the building and go and find the person or the team with the answer or waste time sending an email and waiting for their response, odds are you're right next to that person or team uh, and now you're working right alongside them, so you don't have to wait for a response. Yeah, exactly. It makes it a lot more efficient and faster to communicate. So not only are we rapidly iterating on these spacecraft themselves, but we're also innovating the way that they're made. It's almost too much to keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> we're also posting updates on our account on X. If you can't keep up, that'll help you. So if you don't already, make sure that you follow us at SpaceX on X. And I have a feeling it's going to get pretty busy. Oh, that is definitely an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> and it's definitely going to be very exciting today. <laughs> so with that, let's meet today's Starship on the pad. Starship features two major parts, the ship, which has six Raptor engines, and the Super Heavy Booster, which has 33 Raptor engines. The current iteration of Starship is essentially an experimental vehicle flying for development. With a, flu with a few planned upgrades, Starship will have three times the thrust of Saturn V, plus the added benefit of full reusability. Starship 2 will be capable of carrying more than 100 tons to orbit, and Starship 3 will be able to lift more than 200 tons to orbit. The amount of mass we're able to launch per rocket is crucial to creating a self-sustaining city on Mars. Now, to get a sense of how big Starship is, let's start with the average size human, which is about two meters high. Towering over our average human is the length of the Millennium Falcon, which comes in at 35 meters. Our Falcon 9 rocket, with the payload fairing attached, is double the size of the Millennium Falcon, standing at 70 meters. And nearly twice the size of that is the fully integrated Starship at 121 meters tall. The ship itself is about 50 meters tall, and the Super Heavy booster alone stands about 71 meters. And even crazier, eventually the ship and booster will get even taller with future design iterations. <laughs> can't imagine it being taller than that. <laughs> Starship's first stage has a di diameter of roughly two, point, two and a half times that of Falcon 9 and with 33 much larger Raptor engines, which you can see there on your screen. Moving up the vehicle, the ship features six Raptors, three sea level engines and three vacuum engines, which are optimized to operate in the vacuum of space. The ship is designed for vertical takeoff and landing on any hard surface like the surface of the moon. The ship is also outfitted with four flaps to help aerodynamically control the vehicle's attitude during atmospheric flight and enable a precision landing. To reach full reusability, ship must survive entry not just once, but over and over again. It took the teams at SpaceX about three years to develop the heat shield on Starship, and development for improvements is still ongoing. The ship's heat shield is composed of 18,000 hexagonal ceramic tiles designed to insulate the vehicle during atmospheric entry, where temperatures can be as high as 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And naturally, the tiles are designed for rapid reuse with no refurbishment between flights. As we mentioned earlier, today's Starship features a completely reworked heat shield with stronger tiles and a secondary protective layer. 
This promises to increase our chances of Starship making it through a controlled re-entry and hopefully a little more intact this time around. <laughs> And in between our first and second stages is our hot stage, which we last saw in action on flights two, three, and four. Uh, speaking of, let's take a trip back in time and talk about that last flight. On June 6th, Starship successfully lifted off at 7.50 a.m. Central Time from Starbase, Texas, cleared the launch tower, and went on to accomplish several major milestones and firsts. As you can see there, Super Heavy Booster lifted off successfully and completed a full duration ascent burn. I love the view of the sound waves there. <laughs> Following separation, Super Heavy Booster successfully completed its flip maneuver, boost back burn as well to send it toward the splashdown zone, and it also jettisoned the hot stage adapter, as you can see there. Uh, we don't have to jettison that adapter in future iterations because it'll be uh, a, a, a different design. Now, as you can see here, the booster is returning back to Earth using those hypersonic grid fins to steer it towards a precise landing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the footage that we have coming up here, there it is from the buoy. I still remember seeing this <laughs> on X for the first time, and it was <laughs> so incredible to see that booster coming down, uh, ending its ending its flight with a soft splashdown seven minutes and 24 seconds into the flight and the crowd went wild <laughs> <laughs> and so did we starship's six second stage raptor engine successfully powered the vehicle to space and placed it on a trajectory that would re-enter less than one orbit later over the indian ocean and following a coast phase in space, Starship re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, successfully making it through the phases of peak heating and max aerodynamic pressure, and demonstrating the ability to control the vehicle using its flaps while descending through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. And of course, Starlink on Starship once again enabled real-time telemetry and live, live high-definition video throughout every phase of entry, with external cameras providing views all the way to the flight's conclusion. Flight 4 ended with Starship, <laughs> with, again, the crowd going bonkers, uh, with Starship igniting its three center Raptor engines and executing the first flip maneuver and landing burn that we had seen since our high altitude campaign. And that was followed by a soft splashdown of the ship in the Indian Ocean one hour and six minutes later. <laughs> and we were all glued to the monitors watching the little flap that could the whole way down. <laughs> Seeing the landing burn and splashdown was an incredible moment for the entire SpaceX team. And we'll be looking out for many more of these incredible moments today. All right, so while today's mission profile is similar to Flight 4, we got a couple new test objectives, including catching the booster back at the launch tower. In about 18 minutes from now, Super Heavy will ignite its 33 Raptor engines and lift off from Starbase. A little more than two and a half minutes into flight, the Super Heavy booster will separate from the ship in a hot stage separation. After that separation, the booster will perform a flip maneuver followed by a boost back burn. And about two seconds after that burn ends, we'll jettison the booster's hot stage. As it heads back towards the ground, the booster will either attempt a landing, will have a t uh, landing burn, but then will either return to the tower or splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, the ship's engines will remain lit for just under six minutes during its ascent phase before shutting down for the coast. The ship will coast for about 40 minutes or so, reaching a peak altitude of about 213 kilometers. After that coast phase, the ship will be attempting a controlled re-entry, including a flip maneuver and landing burn, uh, like we saw on Flight 4, just before splashing down in the Indian Ocean. Now, we say attempting because, again, this is just a test and nothing is guaranteed. Except excitement. Ah, well, of course <laughs> there is that. Now, both the booster and ship have to contend with some extreme conditions on re-entry, which is where those heat shield tiles will be put to the test. For this flight test, we do not expect to recover any hardware from the ship. With the exception of Falcon, this is no different than what happens to most rockets flying today that are expended, meaning that they fall into the ocean after completing their mission. Eventually, we will return and reuse Super Heavy Boosters and Starships as we do today with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy Boosters. And in fact, we've landed Falcon Boosters 352 times to date. Oh, man. I hear you say <laughs> that number, and that is just wild. I still remember the night 
or at least most of the night, that Falcon <laughs> Heavy, or excuse me, that Falcon landed for the first time, and it still feels like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, definitely one of my favorite moments at SpaceX. And returning Super Heavy promises to be an even more impressive sight and a huge moment on the road to rapid reusability. Yeah, speaking of rapid reusability, future Starship designs will give Super Heavy boosters a lighter weight and integrated hot stage intended for full reusability, which will mitigate the need to jettison the hot stage like we'll do today. Similarly, even though ship recovery is not expected, the telemetry and data we receive all the way to the end is what we're hoping, or excuse me, is what we're looking for and is what will get us to a rapidly reusable Starship of the future. Yeah, exactly. In other words, just like previous Starship flights, the payload for this mission is the data. All right. Now that we have a handle on today's flight test, let's check in with Dan, who is right in the middle of the action. He's just a few kilometers from Starship on the pad. How's it going, Dan? It's, it's going great, Jesse. Welcome back to Starbase, everybody. It's been far too long. Little change of scenery this time. Right behind me is the Launch Control Center, where our flight controllers are counting down to our liftoff at 7.25 a.m. Central. We are a little bit later in our window. Uh, the main reason is we're working to clear out the range. Have not been tracking any technical issues so far to preclude that launch. So 7.25 a.m. Central, 12.25 UTC is where we're marching down to. As you can see, we're actively loading propellants on board Super Heavy and Starship. Liquid methane for your fuel, liquid oxygen for the oxidizer. Uh, prop load on the ship started at about T minus 49 minutes, booster at T minus 40 minutes. We're going to keep loading propellants on those vehicles right down to the wire. Ship will close out at about 3 minutes and 20 seconds before T zero, and then booster just about 30 seconds later. Now, with our startup sequence, it's going to look very similar to what you saw on Flight 4. We already tested it with this booster and its static fire. We're going to see the Raptors start to make fire at about T minus 3 seconds, and then we'll start them up in three different banks. The first inner 13 will fire, and then about a second later, 15 of the outer ring engines, and then about eight tenths of a second after that, those final five. Another reminder, if we need to hold, we have a built-in spot at T minus 40 seconds. We can hold for stuff like if we need to finish clearing the range or if any other technical issues pop up, just kind of in the last second. But if there's nothing holding us back, we're going to go right past that and go down to zero. So, I mean, as of right now, we're just under 14 minutes away from liftoff, not working any technical issues. Range is expected to clear. We're just clearing out a few more boats. And as you can see, the weather is perfect. We had a 100% go for launch from the weather officer, so that was pretty unprecedented and something we really like to hear. Uh, if we're not able to go today, uh, since we are loading prop, it would likely be about 48 hours before our next attempt. But good thing we're going to launch today. Uh, really looking forward to being able to turn around and see it this time, uh, counting down to 7.25 a.m. Central. And I'll see you guys in a couple of minutes. I'll send it back to you in Hawthorne. Thanks, Dan. Now, one of the most exciting objectives for Flight 5 today is attempting to return the booster to the launch site that you see right there, and it will be caught by the tower. We refer to this simply as booster catch. As you've heard us say, Starship and Super Heavy are designed to be rapidly reused, which is why we're, we've developed a novel way of returning the vehicles that leverages the same hardware we use for stacking ahead of flight. Right now, when we recover our Falcon boosters, the, they either return to a separate landing zone on land or to a drone ship in the ocean, both of which require time to transport the vehicle back to the launch site. In order for us to achieve truly rapid reusability, we need a quicker turnaround. And you can't get much faster than returning, it to, than returning the launch vehicle right back to the launch site where it needs to be in order to launch again. <laughs> For today's booster catch attempt, while there are thousands of criteria that need to be met, there are three primary gates that will be in play. In order to proceed, automated checks have to indicate we have a healthy booster and a healthy tower, and the flight director must issue a manual command, which is informed by manual checks from the flight control team. If this command is not sent prior to the completion of the boost back burn, or if automated health checks show unacceptable conditions with Super Heavy or the tower, the booster will default to a trajectory that takes it to a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, thinking to the future when we're operational, after a booster returns to the launch tower, it will be inspected and reloaded with propellants and then ready to launch another ship to orbit. 
For today's test, however, we're only going to attempt the catch, like Jesse said, if everything on the booster and tower checks out after launch. And of course, we will let you know as soon as we know if it's a go. We're going to be listening very keenly for that call out. Now, as always, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public and our team. So to that end, the area all around the pad and the flight path are cleared well in advance. Exactly. A lot of things have to go right in order to line up the booster catch. So don't be surprised if we don't attempt the catch today. Either way, today's flight will generate data that will continue to inform our future flights and help us get to that operational cadence. Yeah. Oh, you can't forget what else it will generate. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I mean, I was going to say a sonic boom. Oh, I was going to say excitement, but <laughs> that's a really good reminder. <laughs> Now, if we do make it to a catch attempt today, Super Heavy may generate a sonic boom upon its return. And that's basically a brief thunder-like noise that we hear when an aircraft or other object travels faster uh, than the speed of sound. Anyone that has been in the area for a Falcon 9 land landing in Florida or California or even some space shuttle landings may have heard one of these. Generally, the only impact in those surrounding areas of a sonic boom is the brief noise, with variables like weather and distance impacting if or how the sonic boom is heard. Here's a brief look at how these sonic booms look and sound on Falcon. I know a lot of people will be excited when they hear the sonic boom. And these are going to provide quite a show because you're going to hear those sonic booms. As our test flights continue, we plan to demonstrate ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer, which will be an important, which will be important in preparation for Starship taking astronauts to the moon as part of NASA's Artemis program. SpaceX will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before NASA's Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. Also in preparation for missions to the moon and Mars, we're gaining tons of knowledge from our human spaceflight missions, including free, free flyer flights like our recent commercial astronaut mission, Polaris Dawn. Polaris Dawn was the first of up to three missions in the Polaris program, which is demonstrating new technologies, conducting extensive research, and will culminate in a flight of Starship with humans on board. After nearly five days in orbit, Dragon and the four-person Polaris Dawn crew safely splashed down on September 15th off the coast of Florida, completing the first human spaceflight mission of the Polaris program. The Polaris Dawn crew performed some incredible firsts during their mission. Dragon and the crew reached 1,408.1 kilometers, the highest Earth orbit ever flown, and the farthest humans have been from our planet since the Apollo program. The crew also performed the first ever commercial EVA or extravehicular activity. And as you can see there, they were wearing the new EVA suits that we developed here in house. This was an incredible moment to see Jared and then later Sarah uh, emerge and perform this EVA with Earth behind. Now, in addition to this incredible spacewalk, uh, they also conducted about 36 research studies and experiments from 31 partner institutions, including NASA. And in addition to all of that, they also tested Starlink laser-based communications in space. The data gathered from Polaris Dawn missions is invaluable, much like the data that we're going to see after today's flight test of Starship. So we're coming down to T minus uh, about seven minutes. Let's check in with Dan. Hey, thanks, Kate. So yeah, we're, we're right at about seven minutes away from launch. Uh, the main thing we are still working is that range clear. Again, we have to make sure boats, airspace, everything is cleared out of the way for our ascent corridor, basically the Gulf of Mexico, where we're launching through uh, before we can actually launch. And so we're working on clearing out just a few more boats. We do have a window, remember, 
Um, so if we end up holding at like a T minus 40 seconds, we can hold for several minutes, allow those boats to get out of the way, and then we can launch. Our window is from 7 to 7.30 Central, so we don't have a huge amount of time today, uh, but we do have some margin if we need to work with it to, uh, to still get off the ground today. For now, though, uh, we're coming up on finishing prop load on both vehicles. Uh, header tanks are pretty much topped out on the ship. Those are going to be used for its landing burn. Um, and again, we're going to be closing out all of the prop load at about T minus 3 minutes, 20 seconds for the ship, and then just 30 seconds later for booster. Uh, one kind of cool thing to talk about, so the folks in launch control behind me, after liftoff, they're going to have some pretty special tasks today if we're going to go through with the catch. Uh, they're going to be doing some really detailed inspections just visually of all of the different tower systems, a lot of those things that we upgraded, just to make sure that we are in the right posture uh, to actually proceed with the catch. So they'll be working kind of fast and furious uh, behind the scenes to inform the flight director's manual command to send the booster back. So if we if we hear that command being sent, uh, that's going to be just, uh, the roof's going to come off. That's going to be a really exciting moment. Um, so otherwise, if we don't go today, as you guys talked about, there is a chance. And if we don't send the booster back, we'll do a landing burn and a splashdown in the Gulf. And then that's just another landing burn to gather more data, learn more lessons from, and then we'll come back and try to catch again on the next one. But uh, as of right now, we're coming up on five minutes. Uh, there is a chance that we'll hold or extend into the end of our window. So don't be surprised if that ends up happening. But if those boats do get out of the way, we are just about five minutes away from launch. So uh, I'll check back in, in in just a moment, but back over to you, Kate and Jesse. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Our rapid uh, iter iterative development approach has been the basis for all of SpaceX's major innovative advancements, including Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink. Today, we're testing hardware and systems, and we need to know how they perform under the most extreme conditions. We'd much rather find the bugs now during testing than later on when there's more on the line. And to reiterate, we do not, while we do determine an acceptable level of technical risk on our vehicle and pad in order to learn as fast as possible, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public or our team. So that is to say, this is only the fifth of many future flight tests of Starship before it becomes fully operational. You might remember the Starlink panels that are incorporated into Starship, and you can see them there on your screen, those rectangular panels on Starship's nose cone. Starlink brings us the epic views in space and on reentry, and also helps deliver us the critical flight data engineers need to continue development. In addition to enabling our rapid iteration on Starship, Starlink is also enabling life-saving communication here on Earth. SpaceX is sending tens of thousands of Starlink kits in response to Hurricanes Helene and Milton and providing free service through the end of the year to support recovery efforts. The Starlink team also worked with T-Mobile to activate our direct-to-sell satellites to provide basic texting on T-Mobile and emergency alerts for all phones and carriers of those in affected areas. If a phone connects to a Starlink satellite, it will have one to two bars of signal and show T-Mobile SpaceX in the network name. SpaceX's direct-to-sell constellation has not been fully deployed, so these services are being delivered on a best effort basis. Starlink is enabling life-saving communication here on Earth and continues to help us push the limits in space. In the short term, by providing great views and real-time data on our next few flights, particular, particularly through re-entry, which historically is a blackout period for all communications. All right, so we're coming up on two minutes, 30 seconds away from launch. It, we were hearing like there was a pretty good chance we were going to hold at T minus 40 seconds, but surprise, now it sounds like we might not be. So uh, we are just a little over two minutes away, so a couple more things going to be happening. Uh, we did just close out our propellant load on the ship and the booster, so 10 million pounds of propellant on that vehicle on the pad here at Starbase getting ready to go. We're going to start uh, clearing out all of the lines that are basically pushing all of that propellant to the vehicles. Those get cleaned out or cleared out uh, on the ground before we lift off. We're doing some final checks on the vehicle, the thrust vector, the thrust vector control that we're going to use to steer it. 
um, as well as uh, the guidance system doing its final alignment, just a lot of our, our final checkouts. But uh, we are we are starting to hear that it looks like the range is going to be clear at our liftoff time of 7.25 a.m. Central, 12.25 UTC. So that puts us one minute, 20 seconds away from launch. Still not tracking any technical issues. That range clears the only thing that's been uh, potentially poking at our launch. So I'm gonna start to quiet down. We'll hear our flight director for today, Tristan Pierce, give some of the final call outs. As of right now, we are one minute away from liftoff. Flight directors go for launch. Best words you could possibly hear 20 seconds away from liftoff. T minus five, four, three, two, one. Vehicles pitching downrange. Mr. Amber Chamber Pressure Nominal. Thirty seconds into the flight, the rumble's just starting to reach us here at launch control. Booster and ship, that avionics is the power, telemetry nominal. Thirty three Raptor engines. Max Q. Through the maximum aerodynamic pressure, the most stress the vehicle is going to see on the way uphill. All right, our next our next major milestone coming up. It's going to be hot staging. We're going to see the engines ignite on ship to push it away from the booster. So hot staging is going to be the next thing coming up. First, we're going to see the booster's engines start to shut down. All but three. We're going to do what's called most engines cut off instead of main engine cut off, because three are going to keep going. And then we're going to see the engines on ship ignite. Right now, the tower team is doing their go, no go. We might hear some really good words soon, too. All right. You can still see it up behind me. That is one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen in my entire life. We're Coming up on off. hot staging next. Ship engine There's start most up. engines cut off. Stage separation. Booster Stage separation. Right. Hot stage confer separation confirmed. ship under its own power. I'm seeing six out of six Raptors lit. Hopefully I got a booster on the way back to me. I'm going to send it to you guys in Hawthorne. Oh man, that was absolutely <laughs> incredible. I loved how the crowd chamber pressure is nominal. 
crowd here in Hawthorne all went ooh at that first <laughs> view of the blue flames from the booster. As you can see there, first stage currently performing, or excuse me, is uh, now making its way back to uh, the launch site. Again, we are. Ship avionics powered on phenomenal. Uh, the booster and the tower are both performing automated checks to make sure we are go for the booster to return to the launch pad for that catch. And once those are complete, the flight director. And we did hear that the tower is go for catch. So that was one of the big criteria we were looking for. We'll here. wait to hear that the we'll wait to hear that the go for catch has been sent. Beautiful view here from the <laughs> ship. And so exciting to hear that we got a go for booster catch. That means it's going to be a really exciting morning. Again, the booster is making its way back towards uh, now land um, in order to make that catch attempt in the tower. <laughs> so incredible to see these views. You can see the ship on the right-hand side of your screen. All six Raptor engines are uh, under full power. Once again, the, the ship, excuse me, the booster is making its way back to the launch site. We are going to try and catch it using the chopsticks on the launch tower, the exact same tower that it just launched from just, wow, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the booster. Starship on nominal hey guys, trajectory. I, I can confirm the command was sent for the booster to come back. That is incredible. So I'm looking news. up right now. <laughs> it's it's pretty much right over ahead of us, and we can see it starting to come down. I can't wait for us to hear the sonic boom through Dan's mic. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is going to be incredible. It was so cool to hear the lift off. Uh, and so once again, um, a successful on-time liftoff of Starship Flight 5. The ship uh, the, has separated from the booster. The booster is there on your screen. It is making its way back to the launch site. We are going to attempt the catch using the chopsticks. We did hear the confirmation that the command was sent to the tower. Uh, we are go for catch. And in order to... Hey guys, we should just be in about... 30 seconds away from our landing burn. It's going to happen in three phases. We're going to land 13 engines, burn off all of that velocity. Oh, we can see it coming down through the plume. Booster coming in hot for booster catch. We're going to ignite 13 of those Raptor engines, and this view is incredible right now. You can see how fast this vehicle is moving on the left hand of the screen. Landing burn. We're now down to three Raptor engines. We can see those chopsticks now. This is a live view of the Super 
super heavy booster as it has just been successfully caught back at the very same launch tower that it just came from. Dan, I love this. You are reflecting exactly what everybody else here in Hawthorne, uh, except maybe a little bit more because you got to see it with your own eyes. How was that? We got it. But I mean, like, oh, uh, like. Uh, I can't even. I can't even describe that. Oh, by the way, shit. Main engine cut off. Ships in orbit, but I am. I am like shaking right now. That was. Yeah. It. Oh, uh, this is not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's, it's let's checking on ship. It's hard to believe that. Starship nominal orbit insertion. All oh, right, exciting news there. It's hard to believe that, you know, Booster isn't the only excitement that we have today. Just confirmation there, a gorgeous view of planet Earth behind uh, ship the ship. Saved. And it is now in, in the orbit that we expected it to. This is just an incredible day. Live views there as the Booster vents some pressures there. That is a live view from the top of the tower <laughs> looking at the chopsticks. <laughs> I am still in disbelief. I'm trying to catch my tears, just like the chopsticks caught the booster. <laughs> it has been nonstop since liftoff. <laughs> and we are all so excited about everything that's been happening so far this morning. With the booster having completed its job for today, we are going to take a short break. For the next 30 minutes, we'll return back at T plus 40 minutes while the ship continues to coast before re-entry. Oh, man. And <laughs> as with previous flights, Starlink may actually enable us to talk with the ship through re-entry with no communication blackout.